Okay, we will take a few seconds to set up the, the YouTube Neve streaming. Okay, now we are on YouTube. So let me um, start with a brief introduction um, to Dr. Zhang Yao. So, so uh, Professor Yao Zhang is uh, currently a professor in the Department of Mechanics at uh, Huazhong University of Science and Technology. So we call it uh, HUST for short. So prior to join, um, joining at HUST, he worked as a postal fellow at uh, Northwestern University and Pen Pennsylvania State University, where he obtained his PhD degree in engineering science and mechanics in uh, 2016. He uh, previously received his bachelor degree in engineering mechanics in uh, 2008, and his master degree in fluid mechanics in 2011 from HUST. So Professor Zhang's research focuses on the mechanics of bio and polymer based material and soft matter. So today we uh, very happy to have um, Professor uh, Yao Zhang to give uh, a seminar to introduce his recent work uh, on the biopolymer based uh, materials. So thanks for the introduction of Dr. Li and thanks for the invitation from the organizer of this uh, uh, seminar. I'm very happy to share my research with you. So now I will share my screen. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah, looks good. So today, I will share my research about the mechanics of bipolar based salt materials. So today we will first introduce my research interest followed by the list topic mechanics of biopolymer based soft materials. I will introduce two material system. One is network of amyloid fiber. The second one is plant primary cell walls. So my research um, focuses on the mechanics of soft materials. Um, I have uh, work on the soft material system for, uh, from my PhD study. So you have uh, several areas. The first one is the uh, mechanics of biopolymer based material materials. And I do research um, about this plant primary cell wall and also bacterial biofilm. The second area is the cell matrix in action. Actually for this aspect, it's more about the uh, experiments cell experiments. So we do experiments with fabricated gels and the cultural cells on gel. In this case, we just measure the interaction force between the matrix and the cells. And this is also called a tracking force. With the tracking force, we can consider the cell or tissue as the elastic um, material. And also with the, in this case, we can calculate the stress in the tissue or cells, and also investigate how uh, the stress um, influence the cell behavior. I also do some studying about the mechanics of the process. I know that in this seminar, seminar several speakers also talk about this uh, uh, mechanics of the red blood cell, but they are more from the uh, uh, aspect of the fluid. Here, I think in my work, I focus more about this um, uh, characteristics just of this uh, from the uh, certain mechanics. And I also did some research about the mechanics in drug delivery. So basically, we studying how the elasticity of this uh, uh, land particle affect this endocytosis process. And we just investigate the effect of this uh, size and also uh, the, 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 
the size and uh, how the, the shape of land particle influence the endocytosis process. So from the method aspect, I use computational method experiments and also theoretical method. So my background is um, uh, engineering mechanics in, from my bench degree. I also got my uh, master degree from fluid mechanics. So I, so I love both computation methods from the mechanics um, area, but all, and also from the fluid uh, area. But uh, during my PhD study, it's uh, more about this um, simulation method using this uh, uh, solid method. And uh, during my PhD study, I also uh, do some experiment. It's about the same mechanics experiments. So now I use this computation method, experiment method, and also this theoretical method to do research. And uh, the length scale is from the uh, nano scale, uh, micro scale to the continue scale. And we use the these different uh, modern methods such as uh, MD simulation, cross grain modeling, and also the mass scale methods such as the phase field method and the cross grain modeling. We also use this continue modeling. So now I will focus on the topic of this uh, um, uh, this lecture. So it's about the mechanics of bipolar based salt material. Actually, this is my research areas. Um, when we uh, when I begin my postdoctoral research, so I will use two material system. One is the lead works of the amylarial fiber. So I will first introduce this part. So so why we start in this uh, amylarial amylarial fiber? It's because the bacterial biofilm. So what's bacterial biofilm? It's the collection of bacteria. And also is the matrix. It is includes this protein, polysaccharide, and the DNA. So what's the feature of this biofilm? It has excellent adhesion to different surface. So it has it presents significant challenges in medical food and the marine industry. Why? If you look at this uh, ship core, you can see that there is a so, so thick this biofilm, it causes this uh, erosion. So US almost every year we spend about uh, 20 billion dollars to remove in this kind of uh, biofilm. If you look at the inside of biofilm, there's one important fiber, uh, very important for the adhesion of biofilm. That's called this curly fiber. The curly fiber is one kind of amyloid fiber. It's, it's a basic unit. It's called CSGA and CSGB. So it's basically a protein fiber. It has very good uh, mechanical properties. I think it's young uh, modules is around the, about uh, five gigapascal. And uh, it's very important for the adhesion because it has strong adhesion to different uh, surface. So if we use this curly fiber as a material, it will has uh, excellent adhesion property. Actually, people or uh, researchers already use um, this uh, bacteria to fabricate this kind of lead work. Only uh, formed by this curly fiber. So you can see, look, this microstructure is only, uh, it's just uh, only has the curly fiber. And if you uh, test its uh, adhesiveability using FM, yeah, it's, it shows very good uh, adhesiveability. So this kind of material a promising bioadhesive. So my research try to understand why 
this the network structure has excellent adhesion. So we use this cost grade model. Why we use this cost grade model? Because it's network structure, for network water structure, FVM is a method. It's not, it's not easy to implement. So we use this uh, base spring model. I think uh, most of uh, you know this method very well. So basically, you have a lot of bits that are connected by this bond and also spring. The bond gives you the Young's modulus and the angle gives you the persistence length. And use this uh, uh, bits of chain models, we can generate the network structure. For this network structure, at, a, at a first, I think that these fibers are just uh, randomly distributed. And they we add a crosslink between the uh, fibers to generate this crossing crossing current fiber. Now we have lab work. One test is the uh, ability of adhesion. So we let the fiber uh, absorbed on the surface. And we in this case, we just uh, set up the adhesion between the lab work and the surface using a simple uh, average potential. If we tune this uh, constant efficient A, then you can tune the adhesion ability between the lab work and our surface. Now, now we try to use a force, you can see the F, to uh, at the top of this lab work and try to detach this lab work from the surface. So what will happen? You can see that this figure shows the work of the adhesion as a function of this uh, uh, efficient A, which defined the interaction between the lab work and the surface. We have two area. It's in this uh, green area, we call this adhesive failure. In this case, lab work is strong enough. Also, you can say it's stiff enough. And uh, in the, that's because uh, the, the lab work is strong enough. The second area is marked by the blue. In this region, we call the cohesive failure. So in that, in this case, what happened? We can see that the lab work still uh, adhere to the surface, but the lab work itself broke into two parts. So if you want to use the lab work function of the adhesive, we want to we want the lab work work in the first area, which is the adhesive failure. Now we try to tune the uh, structure of this lab work. So we have two methods. One, we can control the persistence length of the fiber. The second one, we can control the cross-link density of lead work. Here, we use the N to indicate the cross-link number per fiber. And the, here, LP is the percent length of the fiber. So we first check how this the percent length and the cross-link density affect the density of lead work. Here, you can see that left figure shows the density row of the lead work as the function of the percent length of fiber. You can see that no matter how you change the lead work density, n, you can see that as long as your fiber percent length increase, you can see that the mass density just uh, decrease. And why? So we check, we check the microstructure of lead work. So in the equilibrium system state, here, LE bar is your mean end-to-end -end distance between two crosslinks. And the LC bar is the mean contour length of the, the fiber between two crosslinks. If you look at this, the ratio of the two lengths, you can, you can see that if you increase the fiber percent length, this ratio just increased. What that means is if a network has a very uh, stiff fiber, 
that means that the, uh, in this case, the pore size will increase and the ratio between the mean distance to the mean contour length will just, uh, uh, will just uh, um, increase. That means that your mean end to end distance increase and also the pore size increase. If you look at the left figure, it means that in this case, the mass density of the network will just decrease. So if you have a, a very thick fiber, the network will just, uh, the pore size will increase and also its density will dramatically uh, decrease. Now, I will look at the individual energy and work adhesion. So let's first uh, introduce what, what does this innovation energy means. The gamma A is innovation energy. So it's just uh, the summation of this potential energy between the surface and the network. So it's a it's calculation. How about this work of adhesion gamma T? The work of adhesion is that so it's the work you have done by the force to detach your network from the surface. So if you look at the innovation energy, you can see that it, it, it as your percent length decrease, you can see that this innovation energy will uh, reach plateau when the uh, percent length reach about, about uh, uh, 50, uh, nanometer like that. If you look at the right figure, it shows the work adhesion as a function of this fiber plus lens. So it, the same trend will happen. So it means that if your fiber plus lens decrease, your network, your network just becomes denser. And uh, the work of adhesion also, we are reaching max value when the uh, five percent lens reach around 100 nanometer. So, what does it mean? It means that if we have a fiber, the, fi the fiber has a smaller percent lens. When the, we have a smaller percent lens, means that the fiber is very flexible and it will form a network with a small pore size larger than mass density, so it will easier to attach the surface. And it means that you have larger facial energy because there's more fiber attached to the surface and you also got the larger work of the adhesion. And also we try to uh, explain the difference between the facial energy and work adhesion. If you look at this, uh, compare the inefficient energy and the work adhesion, you can find that you can see the maximum work adhesion is around the um, 15 uh, microjoule per meter square. You can see that is magnitude is always larger than the inefficient energy. So you have a force try to detach network from the surface and, you, and the work you have done is always larger the inefficient energy. So why? So we try to understand it. So we look at the stress and the strain curve. When you detach the network from the surface, use the force and we get this stress strain curve. So then we can calculate the strain energy. So the strain energy is the area and the stress rate curve the area and the stretch curve, you can see that. So when you calculate strain energy, you can see that um, the magnitude of uh, strain energy is very close to the difference between the work of the fusion and the innovation energy. So this means that if you use a force to detach the lead work from surface, First, you have to overcome this innovation energy between the network and the surface. The second, you have to do some 
artwork. This work is, is stored in the network, which is the stray energy. So if you have the software network, it's easier um, um, it, for the network to store stray energy. And they, which in turn will give you a larger work of efficient. And also we try to find the value that the optional persistent lens give you a maximal work of efficient. Actually, actually we found it. If you uh, normalize the work of efficient by your density, it means that the work of efficient per mass, it can reach a maximal value when the, the Percent length of fiber reach around the uh, several hundred nanometer, like this. Here, you can see that it's around 150 nanometer, like that. So, in this work, we start in how the network um, uh, crossing density and how the fiber lens affect the adhesion of this network. And we found that for the soft network, it will have larger uh, uh, work of adhesion. It means that for soft network, it have a stronger uh, adhesive ability. So next I will introduce another, this bipolar based uh, uh, sorting material system, which is the plant primary cell wall. So why we start this primary cell wall? It's because the material which cause cellulose. So cellulose is the most abundant biopolymer in nature. So we, we can get this uh, cellulose from the you know, wood, from the bacteria, and uh, from the uh, size scale, it has this um, large uh, cellulose fiber, which is at a macro scale, but it is formed by this elementary fiber, which is the, uh, called this, uh, in the plant biology, which causes uh, micro cellulose microfiber. Actually, it's not a microfiber, it's not at a micro scale, it's at a nano scale. I think the diameter of the one Micro cellulose microfiber is around the three, the three nanometer. This cellulose is uh, most abundant in nature and also it has very high stiffness. I think um, you may know that. I think it's uh, uh, stiffness can reach your theoretical value about uh, um, um, 200 gigapascal. It also lightweight, very compatible, eco friendly. So it's an ideal building block for next generation materials. Now, let's, let's we focus on the cellulose in plants. So where does the cell locate in plants? Actually, it's uh, located in the cell wall. The left figure shows a typical wood. The typical wood is in the SEM uh, image. And uh, you can see that it's just the uh, zoom in. In one cell, you look at the uh, uh, cell wall of the one cell. It is very complex. You can see that it has a several layer. The first layer is called a primary wall. The second layer is called a secondary wall. So now you know that for the plant cell wall, it has a two cell wall. One is primary cell wall, the second one is the secondary cell wall. So, so every plant has primary cell wall, but not everyone plants have this secondary cell wall. They are totally different. I think the first, I think is um, uh, primary cell wall is um, uh, includes this cellulose, hemicellulose, and uh, the pectin. But for the secondary cell wall, it's made of this cellulose, hemicellulose and also the nickeling. So you can see that the matrix material is different. 
for the primary cell world, the matrix material is a pectin and uh, hemicellulose. For the secondary cell world, its matrix is this lignin and the hemicellulose. And uh, now um, let's look at the secondary cell world. Secondary cell world almost is the um, is the if it is the main com components of the wood because the cyclic of the cell wall, second cell wall is much uh, thicker than the primary cell wall. So once uh, secondary cell wall develop, it means that your, your cell, plant cell cannot grow anymore because this uh, secondary cell is, uh, has um, the strength so high once it is formed, it means that the, the plant cell will stop grow. So for the second cell wall, it has a high strength, but the little expandability. You can use the secondary cell wall to make this super wood. It's just, uh, so it's the idea is that in the second cell wall, they have a lot of cells. I think it uh, include about 35% uh, of dry mass. That's the your cells. You just need to remove other um, long cells uh, um, part, and then you just uh, densify this uh, wood. You can get this uh, super wood. But my research focuses on the primary cell wall. So why? The primary every plant cell has this primary cell wall because as the it will protect the plant cells. And it will grow uh, as the plant cell grows. And uh, this primary cell will can expand more than 10 times without break or weakening during the plant's growth. So it has excellent extensibility and also can maintain the strength. So if you look at the, uh, I think the uh, list figure on top right, is the microstructure of this primary cell wall. So you can see that you can see a lot of these cellulose microfiber. Yeah. Also, also, it's called a cellulose microfiber. Its size is in the nanoscale. The diam diameter is around three nanometer, but just the, just the tradition call it as a cellulose microfiber. And it's a, it's a primary cell wall is, um, layer structure. So it's made by a lot of layer of this uh, cellulose. And uh, if you look at the cell microfiber, you can see that its diameter is only three nanometer and it can lo it lose 18 chains. It's the, I think it is, this is the um, uh, most uh, elementary fiber for cellulose. Now we have to look at how this plant uh, synthesizes this uh, uh, cellulose fiber. It's just amazing because you can see that if you look at this CSC, this is cellulose synthesis complex. It's a protein. It's a protein where uh, um, synthesize cellulose. I think it's, uh, it's uh, synthesized around the uh, 60, ch 18 chains. This 18 chains we are from uh, a single cellulose microfiber. It's just like uh, you can consider that a plant cell is a smart uh, 3D printer. It will print these uh, fibers one by one. And these uh, fibers, and then we are from this massive scale uh, cell wall structure. And also, it were from a large bundle to form this second cell wall or primary cell wall. So all questions that how does this uh, uh, primary cell wall achieve both mechanical strength and extensibility? Because this primary cell wall has great extensibility. It can expand uh, greatly as long as the uh, cell continue to grow. To start in the, this uh, uh, structure and the uh, property relationship of the primary cell will lead to both experiments 
and also modeling. In the experimental uh, aspect, we need to know the microstructure of this primary cell and also the mechanical response of cell. You can got this data from the macro scale tensor test. For the modeling part, because you, you want to know the uh, uh, mechanism of this uh, uh, structural property relationship, we need to know um, the mechanical role of all component because the primary wall has three components. One is the cellulose microfiber, another one is hemicellulose, the third one is the packing. We also need to know the stress distribution in cell wall. The last one is the uh, molecular mechanism for the elasticity and plasticity of cell wall. So we first uh, did some experimental studies. So we use this uh, onion as the parent cell wall model. So we just, uh, we compare this uh, very thin uh, primary cell wall from the plant. It's only about seven micrometer, but it's, I think it's, it's uh, size, it's just uh, it's a strip of this uh, uh, single layer primary cell wall. I think it's size around the three uh, millimeter by five millimeter and the thickness is only seven micrometer. And we once we got this, we can use the FM to test, to uh, detect its microstructure. And also we use the tensile test to get its stress rate curve. The stress curve, if you look at the stress rate curve of this uh, uh, primary cell wall, it's just a unique, unique because you can see that for the stress rate curve, it has a uh, three region. The first one is the sleeveling region. It needs a, a region. You can see that modulus will keep increasing. The second uh, region we call it the softening region. In this case, the modulus begin to decrease. The last one is linear response. So until the rupture happened in this um, large spray uh, range, you can see that the apparent modulus just uh, almost keep constant. And this uh, trend of surgery curve is much different from other uh, materials such as uh, rubber and also this uh, hydrogel, they are all different. So we want to uh, develop, develop model and to understand the underlying mechanism. And uh, also we want to use the model to explain the, the experimental results. So we want to choose the modern method. There are several choice. One is the continuity uh, level use the FEM. However, in this case, we have no insight in the wall polymer behavior or microstructure. The, the second one is the MD simulation. However, in this case, it's computationally expensive because at least the panel cell is not a, um, it's not a material which has a very uh, light structure. So you, when you use this MD simulation, you need a notch uh, box to represent the material. So finally, we choose the master scale uh, cost grade molecular uh, dynamic, dynamics method. So based on the microstructure we detect from the AFM, we got this uh, uh, cost grade model. So in this case, um, we have uh, in this model, it's the size around the 900 nanometer by 900 nanometer. We use a periodical boundary condition in all three direction. And here you can see that on, the, on this figure, we shows that we have four layer actually, in the real uh, primary cell wall, it had around uh, 200 layers. But here we can um, only stimulate about uh, four layers, but we use uh, periodic boundary condition. And uh, we have uh, three components. The first layer is the purple chain, which is cellulose microfiber. This green chain represents this uh, hemicellulose, which is called the cell glucan. This uh, yellow chain represents the uh, matrix material packing, 
I think in the primary cell wall, uh, I think the in the dry mass, the packing you know, around the around the from sixteen or I think it's around sixty percent of the dry mass, which is the packing. And uh, use this model, and uh, we can represent the uh, this cell wall. So in each layer, we have four layer. Each layer, I think the orientation of the cells are different. So in the first layer, we use uh, choose the uh, orientation of the minus fifteen degree for the uh, cells. If you look at this. Uh, uh, figure E here, you can see that. So, so majority of fiber has an orientation of the minus 15 degree, and for F is the second layer. You can see that the majority of the fiber has the orientation of the 55 degree. <clears throat> for the third layer in the figure G, majority of the fiber has the orientation of minus 55 degree. So the last layer we have a uh, orientation of the 75 degree. So using this model, we can investigate the structural property relationship of the primary cell wall. And also it's the first computation model which can uh, use to examine the current view of the primary cell walls. So this is the, our experimental result. So from the uh, metrical scale, we can get a stress rate curve. So we want to or uh, use the modeling to you know, reproduce this stress rate curve. So uh, this figure shows the experimental result. Actually, we use uh, uh, three onions and uh, this uh, blue line is the model. Here you can, if you look at the stray, we just calculate stray range from zero to uh, a stray of the point of one two. In this region, you can see that the model result just uh, uh, match with the experiment result. For the experiments, you can see that is for the experiment, it will fail and the stray around them. I think it's or one hundred fifty like that percent. Here in the modeling, we can only uh, simulate the strain range from zero to point one two. Because if you want to simulate a larger uh, strain range, you need to uh, have a fiber much longer. Because uh, I think in the reality, the fiber maybe uh, has a length of more than one micrometer or several micrometer. But in our model, you can see that because as I showed before, because our box size is only 900 nanometer, so the fiber length is must less than 900 uh, nanometer. So it's an emulation of our, our model, so we cannot simulate a very large strain range. And in this uh, modeling strain range from zero to 0 0.12, our modeling result uh, match with the experiment result, and also, if you look at the uh, modules, it has the same um, trend. At the beginning, these modules will increase and they will decrease. Now we try to understand the mechanical role of work component. We have introduced uh, that this primary cell wall has three main components. One is cellulose. The cellulose is stiff because it has, it has very large Person lens. And for the cell do cooking and the packing, they are flexible. I think the person lens of the cell do cooking and packing is around the 10 nanometer. So compared with cellos, I think the cellos microfiber has a person lens around the, uh, one micrometer. So it's much larger, much stiffer. So it was, it was you. As shows in this uh, figure, you can see that if you check the stress in each wall component, you can see that this um, red line, which means the stress within the cellulose, you can see that this line is uh, overlap with the 
stress in the work in the cell wall. So it means that the cells sustain most of stress in the cell wall. Now we try to uh, check if the cellulose cell cell uh, cell uh, uh, action determine the cell wall the uh, stress rate curve. Actually, as you here, you can see that D01, which is the binding energy between cells and the cells. Here, all the interaction between these wall components are long bonding interaction. So it's cellular cellular allocation is of binding energy is large. We can, if you vary this value from the 15 kBT to 60 kBT, you can see that the stress straight curve change a lot. So it uh, um, supports that this uh, cellulose is made uh, on load bearing component. And we also try to uh, change the length of the cellulose. We also found that uh, if you change the length of cellulose, your strategy will also change. So uh, it means that it's the cellulose which uh, say, say most of stress in the cell wall. It also determine the mechanic property of the primary cell wall. And also we try to uh, change the parameter for the other two wall components, such as the packing lens and uh, the binding energy between packing and other wall polymer. It doesn't uh, generate a uh, very large um, change in the stratified curve. And, the, and when we even add cross link between the pectins, you can see that there's not much change with or without the cross links. The say for the Zadukin, you can change the Zadukin lens, and also you can change the binding energy between uh, Zadukin and the cellulose. It just uh, didn't cause a uh, oh, profound change in the strategic curve. So it's all point that the cellulose microfiber are the main load bearing component. Now uh, we'll check the stress distribution in cell wall. So we have three layer. The first layer is the minus 15 degree. The second layer is the 55 degree. The third layer is the minus 45 degree. And the last layer is 75 degree. Now, we, because when we do the stretching experiment and the stretching direction, is all around the zero degree. So you can see that the, the minus 15, the matter is have the orientation most, most close to the straight direction. So in this case, this uh, layer is the matter has a uh, hold the larger stress in the cell wall as shows in this red line. If you look at uh, the fourth layer, which is the 75 the matter, which is it is the uh, gray line. You can see there. In this case, the stress is very very low. In this uh, the matter, which has the largest correlation, because uh, I think uh, because you stretch it along the zero direction, so if uh, your stress fiber, uh, your fiber has orientation of the 50, 75 degree, it means that. The orientation of the fiber is the most perpendicular to your uh, stretch direction. So you will have a very uh, slow, small, for, small stress in the lamellar. This is another, and this four figure show the stress in the fiber. And the stretch direction is along the, uh, is, uh, is on the horizontal direction, you can see that. And the red region, if you look at red region in this um, uh, left top figure, you can see that. If you look at location of fibers, these fibers are all uh, has orientation on uh, which is close to your strength direction. So it can uh, sustain high stress. It's just like uh, what happened in the composite material. I think in composite material, you also just have the same trend. 
if you stretch your uh, composite material, the fiber, which it has, uh, uh, which is, uh, is whose orientation is close to a stretching direction, has uh, the largest stress. So here, you can see that this primary cell wall just uh, very similar to your um, uh, composite material. Now we try to understand how this uh, cell fi cellulose fiber can generate this uh, uh, unique stress rate response. And we look at the orientation change of the fiber and also look at the movement of the fiber. And uh, we found there's a several uh, type of uh, movement of this uh, fiber. The first one is the straightening. What does that mean? So when you stretch your cell wall, some fiber just uh, uh, become more straight. The second one is uh, curving, which is opposite of this straightening. If you look at this the fibers, those fibers has orientation, which are perpendicular to a strand reaction. The third one is the sliding. That means that you have this cellulose fiber bundle. Within the bundle, it's the one fiber beginning to slide over other fiber. The first one is the reorientation. So when you stretch in your cell wall, some fiber just begin to rotate. I think the rotation direction is that after you rotate, the orientation of the fiber is close to your strand direction. And we check this, uh, the, the, how does the, this fiber move during the scratching process? So we'll first check the end-to-end -end length of the fiber. If you look at this figure, it shows the normalized end-to-end -end length as a function of a strain. So you can see that um, in this case, we just uh, stretch a single layer, a single layer of this uh, uh, cellulose. The cellulose this uh, has five single layer. Each single layer has a, 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 a uniform orientation, which is uh, zero degree, 30 degree, 45 degree, 60 degree, and 90 degree. So if you look at the list uh, zero degree, it means that you stretch your layer who has a cellulose fiber. Uh, I think the cellulose fiber orientation is the same as the strand direction. So what will happen if you look at the blue line, you can see that the end-to-end -end length will first will linearly increase and then it will reach your plateau. Once reach the plateau, we use the dash line mark. In this case, you can see that. So when the end-to-end -end, end -end length increase, we call it straightening. When it reach your plateau, it means that the end-to-end -end length of the fiber will not change. So what will happen? In that case, sliding will happen. It means that just look at the straightening of the, in this movie. So at the beginning, you stretch the uh, uh, layer. At the beginning, this fiber will become straightening. And once you reach the max uh, end to end length, they just stop it because they cannot uh, uh, straighten anymore. And in this case, that will happen. The same for other the matter with different orientation. And also, if you look at the, the there's two uh, layer, which is the green eye and the gray eye. In these two curves, you can see that the end-to-end -end lens keep decreasing. That's because it's more like a Poisson's ratio, because your when you stretch your layer, the set orientation just the almost perpendicular to your strand direction. So it means that it will 
um, you will, it will be compressed along the direction which is perpendicular to the steering direction. And we also check the orientation change. You can see that if your, the manner has a deeper orientation, it's actually when you have an orientation of zero degree or 90 degree, what do you see? You don't see the orientation change. If your no, cellulose orientation is uh, between 45 degree and 60 degree, that has a maximal orientation change. And also we try to link the stretch curve with the movement of this cellulose. And uh, here it shows the stress rate curve of different uh, uh, lamellar, which has different uh, cellulose orientation. So basically, we conclude that when the cellulose is, uh, has a movement of straightening, in this case, the modulus of the uh, the matter will increase, which is the stiffening region. When the sliding happened, which is marked by dash line, in that case, softening will happen, and then also the modulus of the, the matter will decrease. And also, in some cases, that if your uh, cellulose fiber orientation is very large, and then that means this, uh, the matter will not carry much stress. So the last part of our introduce the narrow scale basis of cell elasticity and plasticity. If you look at the, if we do the, the cyclic loading, the left figure shows the experiment result. So we do, do two cycle. The first guy, uh, the first uh, cycle loading and unloading is marked by the blue line. So the red line is the second uh, loading and unloading. Loading is the solid line, the unloading is dash line. So if you look at the, it's the stress rate curve of the two cycle, you have found that the first the loading press, the solid blue line, you can see that is different from the loading line of the second cycle. And if we continue to do Cyclical loading, cyclical loading. If you have a third cycle, the third cycle, it will have the same stress curve as the second cycle. So only the first cycle has different loading curve. It's just the solid blue line. And we, if we do the modeling, we found the same case. So basically the plastic dimension only occurs in the first cycle. So you can see that at the first cycle, you do loading and do unloading, there's a residual strain. And uh, this is the permanent uh, uh, strain. And when, once you begin your second loading, unloading, and the residual strain are still there. And also you can do the third cycle, it doesn't change. And we also checked what happened. So basically, this figure shows how the long lines, the fiber end-to-end -end lens change as the as you do in this cyclic loading. So you can see that in the first cycle, this the you can see that this blue uh, arrow shows that you we see a plateau of this uh, the blue line. So as I um, introduced before here, once we see the plateau, it means that uh, sliding happened. So if the sliding happened, then it means that we generate this uh, permanent uh, strain. You can see that this uh, is plateau. Also, you can see the sliding only happened in the first cycle in the second cycle and in the third, in the third cycle, as long as you keep the maximal strain the same, it will not have this uh, uh, plastic deformation. 
So it's, uh, what we found is that this microfiber sliding is responsible for cell wall plasticity. And they, if you look at the third cycle, or if you look at a second cycle or third cycle, it's uh, fiber end to end length just is um, recoverable because in the third cycle or in the second circle, in the, in the second cycle and in the third cycle, the change of the end-to-end -end length the same, the same. And also the orientation change in the uh, second cycle and the third cycle are the same. They are repeatable. So it means that this straightening, curving, and reorientation are the basis of cell elasticity. The just cost elasticity. And the plasticity is come from the microfiber sliding. So what we get is that we develop uh, the first model, which can predict cell wall mechanic behavior based on the microstructure. And also we found that primary cell wall uh, has the high nonlinear stress rate response. The cellulose fiber are the main loading bearing component. And the finally we found that the orientation dependent the movement of the cell fiber regulates the cell wall mechanical behavior. Okay, let's work. Uh, thanks, Professor John. Very uh, interesting and talk. And uh, uh, if uh, our audience have uh, questions to and uh, Professor John, you can unmute yourself and ask a question directly to Professor John. So maybe I start off with a very uh, simple one. And I, I know you. Uh, this work is published last year on science. So, so I just wondering uh, when you consider published a science paper and a regular journal paper, what's the main difference on the thinking? I think you do have to present the work as concise as possible. It's we spend a lot of time we spend a lot of time to modify the um, uh, words because we you know you can only have uh, I think the four thousand and five hundred words for this article, and if it's a report, it's only have uh, two thousand five hundred words you can use. Okay. Okay. So so use a shorter article to tell a good story. It's very important. Yeah. And also yeah. need to relate to to um, kind of more um, public concern, right? Uh, so actually, if we publish journal paper, we will focus more on some uh, technique, maybe some uh, some uh, technical part, method part, or some. Uh, yeah, I, I think the method part is a war in the uh, supplementary information. The supplementary information actually is longer than your um, main text. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, I have a question um, uh, um, on the for the page twenty two. So uh, in the So in this setup, you are try, trying to um, um, peel the owning uh, the, the the primary cell wall from the owning. So so I, I know all the uh, plant actually the the uh, the, the um, main component is uh, cellular uh, fibers. So it doesn't matter owning or wood or or other uh, kind of uh, plant plants. They all have the the, the similar uh, material, but what's the main difference to generate the huge when you do the stress the string curve? So maybe for only you can get twenty about twenty um, um, mega par, but for uh, the the super wood maybe you can get a ten ten times higher strength. So what's the main difference to generate? Uh, Using the same material, but the plant have significantly different uh, strengths or mechanical response of the materials. Yeah, it is all, all depends on the uh, composition and the structure of this the primary cell wall and the secondary cell wall. So, the first, I think the uh, 
the mass percent percentage of cells in these two cells are different. I think in the uh, secondary cell, I think the gram mass is uh, around the uh, 35 gram mass is cells, but this is not the case of primary cell. In the primary cell, the percentage of the cell is much lower. And also for the primary cell, I think 80% is water. So you can consider the primary survey as the hydrogel. Actually, okay. it's, a, it's hydrogel. Okay. Uh, I had a follow up question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So 8% of the component are water. So, yeah. Did, did you consider water in, in your modeling? Did the water play a role in this? Kind yeah, of yeah. Micro mechanics? Uh, I, in the modeling, we use the land one thermostat. So, we use land one thermostat to simulate the water effect. We cannot afford to uh, simulate the uh, uh, explicit water. Okay. And the, uh, so you focus on the uh, tensor, basically tensor property, right? And also, yeah. The, yeah. Did you also yeah. look at the, for example, the shear compression or other uh, uh, mechanical property? If you look at this uh, experimental sample, you can uh -huh. see that it, it's just a very thin layer, only oh. seven. Micrometer, so we can only do tensile test. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very difficult to pure this uh, very thin layer from the audience scale. Actually, yeah. it's just like you pure graphene, one layer graphene. It's just I, I think the idea is similar. Yeah. So, any other question from our audience? Oh, hi, uh, Professor Yao Zhang. Uh, this is Zhao Yan from University at Buffalo. So, uh, so, uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for your interesting talk. So I, I do have a question about the first part of your talk regarding the uh, fibrous like uh, uh, material. So would you mind to go back to, uh, yeah. uh, yes, maybe, yes, here. So uh, I, I'm just curious uh, if this fibrous uh, material, I, I know this is a simulated system. I'm not sure if it can also represent any realistic uh, like material. So do you uh, calibrate those uh, parameters to, uh, uh, to match any realistic uh, like material behavior? Uh, actually it's like a general model. We, it's very difficult to match the we try to match the amyloid fiber network. We tried, but we at that time we didn't have the experiment result actually for us to match. I see, I see. Then basically, yeah. this is uh, more like a mathematical model, right? To understand yeah. the adhesion and also the damage process by tuning the abstract uh, uh, the the parameter uh, okay. uh, for the like inter uh, inter. Uh, interactions between the subject uh, as uh, between the matrix and the surface, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a more uh, you will get a general trend, but you cannot uh, match your real system because for the real system you need to to like uh, like drive data we don't have. I see. Yeah, uh, and my second question about uh, here is, uh, so you mentioned uh, uh, with a, a shorter persistent lens, so the material can be more soft, right? More flexible. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you mentioned maybe the soft material can store more string energy during the, the tension, tension test, right? Yeah. But yeah. I, I'm just, uh, uh, thinking so in from the perspective of me mechanics so uh, considering the difference between the soft material and the hard material so hard material can uh, sustain higher loading mechanical loading and when we compute uh, the strain energy basically that's kind of an integration uh, for the area below the stress strain curve but when we have a higher like a uh, uh, um, uh, uh, strength uh, that may correspond to the lower string. So, but, so I cannot see the clear logic why 
the soft material can sustain higher, can store higher uh, uh, string energy. Like a, a soft material can deform more to generate more string, right? But meanwhile, the stress yeah. is is lower than the uh, the um, uh, the stiff uh, the strong like material, the hard material. So I, I'm just I can uh, I, I'm not sure if I may have any kind of misunderstanding here. So would you mind? To yeah. 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 If, yeah. If you look at this, uh, for different curves, uh -huh. you can see that for the Black line in that case, I think the person is the is the shortest one. Okay. And for the green line, it's the fiber has largest person length. You can see that. Actually, yeah, you're right. So for the green line, you can clearly you can see that the slope is larger. It means that the modulus is larger. Yeah, right. But you were detached at a very much smaller uh, string. Okay, I see, I see. Yeah, maybe it's because it's uh, too uh, brittle and uh, it will break too fast. <laughs> Even the yeah. slope is uh, much higher, but it will break up very quickly. Got it, got it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> for, for, for this point. Yeah, very yeah, actually, yeah, actually, in our group, I think when we did this uh, computational research, I think uh, our former, uh, I don't know, research members, I think that's Xia Wenjie. And he did some similar work using this polymer, polymer material is solids. In the other case, this polymer solids is, is, is very stiff. In the other case, they found that the work of the fission is almost the same as this, this um, the innovation energy. Actually, the innovation energy is just the summation of your potential energy between the, the network and the uh, surface. If it, is, it means that if adhesive is just a sleeve, in that case, I think the, in that case, work of adhesion is almost equals your innovation energy. Innovation. Yeah. So basically, the, uh, the string energy stored inside of the material is very, very low, right? Yeah. So it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, when you do this kind of calculation for the interfacial energy, so what formula uh, do you use? How, how, how did you compute this interfacial energy for the system? I think um, just summarize the, uh, all the total uh, energy potential uh, um, between the base from the particle, the base from the network, and also the base from the surface. It's faster. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. So follow up to Zhao Yan's question, I want to uh, uh, ask a question about the, the, uh, the polymer network. And when you, when you build the polymer network, currently you are using the homogeneous uh, polymers, right? So the same name, same yeah. property. So for uh, realistic polymer network, uh, uh, usually you cannot uh, get a so uniform polymer. Usually is uh, even the the property of the polymer are, is a distribution. I'm not sure if you con consider if you have a distribution of the polymer property, you you build this uh, kind of thing as a similar polymer network. Is this will significantly change the property or just uh, you will get a similar mechanical property? Uh I think um, there may be different, but the trend are the same because we just kind of kind of afford the computational cost. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think the the physical law are still the same, but the, uh, yeah, if you just use a more diverse uh, polymer to represent this network, the way you sure you will get the different result. But I'm not I'm not sure the differences. Significant. I don't think that the difference is profound. Okay. Okay. Because if you have a shorter one and a longer one, and then then if you do the uh, tensor test, and then you may have a longer curve for extension. Because, for example, you you have a short polymer maybe break up uh, 
at the early stage, but you have sure that's true. Yeah, I agree with you. This is this happened. If you look at uh, this uh, network of this uh, uh, similar uh, sellers, uh, if you look at the sales nail paper, yeah, the same. You can make the seller sales nail paper from shorter uh, uh, fiber or longer fiber. You get a total different. Uh, uh, stretchery curve. That's just because the difference between the uh, lens. Yeah. And you also uh, simulated the the failing pattern, right? So, yeah. Uh, do you mind elaborate a little more on the uh, base how you define the uh, failing criteria for this uh, network? Um. Oh, you mean a failing criteria? Failing criteria, you know, it looks like we can, yeah, we can see this kind of failing pattern. So, yeah, how, how you make it work? <laughs> Just look at the simulation whether this um, majority of this uh, network can detach from the surface. If the kind of the majority of the network can detach from the surface, it means that a failure will, will not happen. If it, if it just in this case, you can see that the majority of the uh, uh, network which in, in contact with surface just stay there, doesn't move. So this mean you can you can compute a density profile of the the polymers, and you you maybe maybe I take one percent of the density, and, and I think this one one percent of bulk density then. You need to take some num number, right, to to determine. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. You can see that I I choose uh, several points. At least data point, you can see clearly difference. For example, in in this uh, the highest point, you can see that it uh, doesn't have this uh, failing within the ladder work. But in select point, we can clearly see this uh, um, cohesive failing. You can see that it. Uh, uh, network break into two parts. So, there so, maybe... so do you have any control uh, uh, for the for the uh, surface uh, the the detachment from the surface, or you you break the, uh, in the middle of the network, or you you call a cohesive failure? Is there any control you can do? Control, for example, control the process to to determine if if you do that tensor test is uh, is it will break at the surface or is it will break in the middle of the mm. network. Maybe through the control of the epsilon a, like a larger epsilon a, a, you will have the cohesive failure. A lower epsilon a, you have the ad adhesive failure. But you also need yeah. the yeah. linker, the density of cross linker, right? And then you also, I think, raised both to the option A and also the property property of the network. If your property your network is very strong, you, for example, you have a higher cross the cross link density, or you know, larger uh, fiber person lens, then you may is it's much difficult to have this uh, uh, cohesive failure. Okay, makes sense. Any other question? I think, I think it's your point the most uh, uh, important problem because if you do some modeling, you cannot match with the real system. Yeah, it is a problem. Yeah, that's what I'm also struggling with. So uh, like uh, to uh, simulate the realistic system, so the parameter calibration process is a big pain. So I don't know how to overcome that challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why later I do modeling based on the experiment result. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes that uh, I think this kind of uh, uh, general simulation is someone call is useful. It uh, 
at least the generate profile some insight. Also, it cannot link to your uh, concrete uh, um, realistic uh, system. Oh, by the way, have you published this work for any journal? Yeah, yeah, I published it on Soft Matter. Soft Matter, th last year or? Uh... It's in 2018, yeah. Okay, nice. I, I will definitely check that out. Yeah, I think it's 2018, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And if we do not have uh, other questions, then we thank Professor Zhang for the interesting talk. So if our audience have any other questions, you can contact uh, Professor Yao Zhang directly. Uh, so we will post uh, his contact information on our website. Thank you, Yao. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. <laughs> nice we're work. happy to discuss